Good afternoon, I'm Anna Siefkin. I'm the Executive Director for the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation, and we're very excited about our guest today. Um, before I get into her introduction, a couple of upcoming announcements. So the first, on October 22nd, Sue Babinick, who's the Program Lead for Grid Storage at Argonne National Lab, will be here to, dis to deliver a distinguished lecture on grid energy storage strategies. So that's October 22nd in this room over lunch. On October 29th, Michael O'Sullivan, who is Senior Vice President of Development for Next Era Energy Resources, will return to campus to give a distinguished lecture on utility scale wind and solar power and where it stands in 2019. So we actually just opened registration for that. Uh, it's only in two, uh, 20 days, so we want to make sure that you go ahead and get registered for that if you are not already. That will also be um, at the lunchtime hour. Um, on November 14th, Scott Institute Systems Scientist Panos Mutos uh, will present on rethinking power systems architecture for serving exurban residential paradigms during a lunch and learn in partnership with Metro 21, also in this room. Invitation will come out for that one soon. And finally, we have not even posted yet that we have uh, CMU alum Mark Messler from Bloom Energy who will be speaking on November 20th. So quite a few, got four more lectures during the course of this semester. So very excited to have these guests on campus. And so without much further ado, I want to introduce Melody Kenderdine. She's the principal of EFI, Energy Futures Initiative, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. She is also currently a visiting fellow at the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago, which is called EPIC. Kenderdine served at the Department of Energy from May 2013 to January 2017 as both the energy counselor to the secretary and the director of DOE's Office of Energy Policy and Systems Analysis. She produced two installments of the Quadrennial Energy Review and helped to conceive of and develop the energy security principles adopted by the G7 leaders in 2014. Prior to her service at DOE, Kenderdine helped to establish the MIT Energy Initiative, which they call MITE, and serve as its executive director for six years. She also told me this morning she was the longest serving political appointee, political appointee um, in the Department of Energy. So welcome, Melanie. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you all for uh, coming today. The, uh, the, uh, I worked for four years in the Obama administration. I worked for eight years in the Clinton administration. And, um, and uh, we are talking to people about writing a book on en how energy policy really gets made. Um, you don't read about it. Uh, where's the sound person? Now I'm not, I'm, am, I, am I live? OK, all right. The, um, so, so what I wanted to do today is to um, talk to you all about uh, we released a paper at the Energy Futures Initiative. We are a small think tank. Uh, there are three principals, Secretary Moniz, uh, me, and Joe Heizer, who's a CMU graduate. I think many of you have heard from him before. Um, and we are focused on the policy and technologies for energy policy and technology for deep decarbonization. And so that's taking up a lot of our time and effort um, we released a, a paper called The Green Real Deal. I'll s explain to you a little bit about what we mean by that. I'm sure you've all heard about the Green, uh, the green New Deal. And, and, uh, and this is a uh, Green New Deal, and I'll just say a little bit about it in a minute. I mean, now, is, is a aspirational document. It is a uh, resolution, a, a House resolution by definition is an aspirational document. It's not, it's not written in statutory language. It's not, it's not intended to, to become law. And so, so, nor is it at a detailed program. Um, it has some things in it too that I think are, are problematic from, from uh, uh, things one might achieve in, in the near term, and I'll discuss that in a minute. So, so we have put out a paper called the Green Real Deal, how one might implement the Green New Deal, and which, which is uh, it in, in, its, uh, in its best form has focused the country on deep decarbonization. 
and, uh, and which I think is incredibly valuable and important. And so we just came back from uh, the New York City Climate Summit, the UN's Climate Summit. Uh, we were there last week or the week before. I, I lose track of time. And, uh, and I think the active young people there were very inspirational and in part inspired by the, uh, the Green New Deal. So today I'm going to talk about some key global trends and issues uh, that, that people should be paying attention to and knowledgeable on, uh, U.S. trends and issues. Um, uh, we just also released a, a uh, study earlier in the summer um, of California, a uh, deep decarbonization study of California. I'll talk a little bit about the results of that. They are highly instructive. Um, for, for other regions of the country and, and states, and so I want to talk about that. And some energy security issues. When I was at DOE in the Clinton administration, I spent a lot of time on oil, oil crises, et cetera, et cetera, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, and, uh, and, and some new issues in energy security that, that are arising as we develop new systems, new technologies, and then the Green Real Deal. Um, that I mentioned earlier. So let's start. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, just read these. Okay, this is why we need to pay attention. Um, nine of the ten warmest years on record between 2005 2016. Arctic warming is two to three times faster than the global average. The temperature in the Arctic has increased by three degrees in like the last ten years. It is stunning. Um, sea levels rising seven to eight inches since 1900. Um, uh, May 2019, atmospheric CO2 concentrations reached 415 ppm, the highest level in 800,000 years, at least 800,000 years, maybe longer. At the current rate of warming uh, at 0.2 degrees per decade, we could hit 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2030, 11 years from now, less than 11 years from now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about 1.5 degrees. That's the more aspirational target coming out of Paris. Uh, uh, the, the nation's committed to two degrees, and I'll explain why uh, the difference between them. There are big differences. That's what that says. Um, uh, at two degrees, 37 percent of the world's population will experience extreme heat. And as of 2018, two-thirds of the major emitting countries, we are one of them, are not on track to meet their Paris targets. Uh, our emissions uh, have declined uh, between 2014 and 2017. Last year they went up. So, so it's a problem. This, these are some of the differences. Uh, in impacts between 1.5 and 2 degrees, and there is a, an, an animation error in this slide I forgot to fix. Uh, this is just the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, and what I would say is it's only 0.5 degrees. At this point, every tenth of a degree that we uh, reduce temperature rise is very important when you've got these kinds of differences between 1.5 and 2 degrees, and this is a difference. Ten times the number of ice-free summers, uh, two times the vertebrates that lose their, their uh, range, crop yields, 2.3 uh, times reduction in tropics maize harvest. I thought for a long time rice was the largest grain crop in the world. It's maize. Um, many more people in uh, farming uh, corn in the world than rice. And this is the one that, that is covered up, and it's I think it says 29% fewer coral reefs under there, okay, than, than a decline in coral reefs. Um, I thought this was a stunning photo. This is a NOAA photograph, National uh, Oceanographic uh, uh, Administration, uh, Atmosphere and Administration, and um, this is 2013 Bering Sea Ice. This is what it looked like in 2018. And when the NOAA scientists looked at this, this is a quote, they were amazed. It was about half of what we usually have in the winter. To be blunt, all of us were shocked. This isn't how it's supposed to work. So, so I, I'm sure you all have read about uh, uh, the funeral that they had for a glacier in, in Iceland um, recently, and uh, it is problematic. Temperature differences between 2018 and the average of 1980 to 2010. So that's what this is, and, um, and the, the dark is the, let me go back, 
This is what the Arctic looks like. The dark here is six degrees, okay, and that's what you're seeing in the Arctic. Um, uh, you look here, you're seeing a little less temperature increase in the Antarctic, but substantial amount. Um, looking at the Mediterranean ring, basically, I think you're already seeing the impacts of some of that with the immigration out of, out of, from, from northern Africa to southern Europe. Southern Europe is going to get hit dramatically on this as well. Um, you look here, U.S., the western U.S., where I'm from, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, southern Africa, uh, highly problematic, and I was surprised by this, this the Pacific, that part of the Pacific, uh, big temperature increases, and then of course Australia. Global water stress, and this is a, uh, 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 and the, the darker areas are where you see more water stress. Okay, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the uh, key over here. By 28% of the world lives in water scarce countries. By 2080, this will be 43 to 50% of the world living in water scarce countries. These are tipping points in the Earth system. You can look at them. I'm just going to go through them. We don't, we don't need to read them. I, I, and I can make these slides available for anyone who wants them. And I mentioned we're not meeting targets. This is what happened, uh, CO2 emissions in uh, 2000 to 2017. India uh, up 2%. Uh, EU down only slightly in spite of, in spite of their uh, policies. U.S., as I mentioned, we went down 2014 to 2017. Uh, we're going back up. Uh, we went up 2.7% uh, between 2017 and 2018 from fossil fuel emissions. China flat. The rest of the world, look at the rest of the world. So, so big problems. I'm going to skip through this one. It says basically the same thing. Um, this, is, this was stunning to me. I actually sent my staff back to, uh, to uh, check the numbers because I thought it couldn't possibly be right. This is population growth in the world's 20 most populous countries um, and what the population growth, what it is now, and what it will be in 2050. What I don't know if these are the 20 most populous countries in 2050. I just looked at the top 20 here. Uh, Nigeria becomes the third most populous country on the planet. Nigeria, right now it's the U.S. Nigeria will surpass the United States in population in 2050. It has one-sixth the land mass. You see that all over Africa. Egypt goes from 88 to 151 million. Ethiopia, 99 to 188. Congo, 79 to 195. And I've spent a fair amount of time in Africa in the last couple of years, and, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Those are the countries that actually lose population. So Germany, Russia, China, Japan, and Thailand lose population. India becomes the most populous country on the planet. And, and um, the thing that I find interesting about that, Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi says, has made universal access to electricity a policy. By 2022, universal access to electricity, that means adding 450 million people to the electric grid, if he's successful. And India gains 500 million people by 2050. That is 950 million people, almost a billion people in one country that we are adding to an electric grid. And I look at it, India basically is a pile of lignite. It's sitting on lignite coal, low quality coal, and they need electricity. Um, so uh, you can, you can um, uh, uh, judge what needs to be done from a technology perspective from just that number alone, but there's going to be a 24% increase in population in these countries by 2050. Um, urbanization is another trend that is critical. Uh, this is the U.S. Um, the light green is urban population, the, uh, uh, is rural population, light green, or dark green, urban population. It's 1950 with projections to 2050, and you can see that uh, rural is flat or declining. Uh, urban populations go way up. I look at this and think smart cities is very important. Okay, um, this is global population. Um, interesting statistic in 2007, for the first time in human history, the number of people in the world living in urban areas surpassed the uh, number of people living in rural areas in 2007, first time in history. 
These are, uh, this is populations of cities um, between 1990 and 2030. 2030, not very far away, the world will be adding an equivalent of 10 cities of 10 million or more people uh, uh, by 2030. In the next 11 years, four of them will be in Africa. Um, uh, and 326 to uh, 220 cities of 1 to 5 million people and uh, about, what is that, 180, 180 uh, cities of 500 to 1 million. So smart cities are important for this too, but they'll be very different kinds of cities uh, than, than the ones we typically think of. And they're going to need energy. And here's why. There is a one-to-one -one correlation between electricity consumption and where a country sits on the human development index. Okay, that's a UN development index. It's literacy, education, standards of living, et cetera, et cetera. Way up at the, and this is, this is your electricity consumption here, and this is where you sit. Okay, so you see the uh, Europe, United States, et cetera, et cetera, at the top. Um, in both electricity consumption and where they sit on the uh, HDI and you start moving down the chain. Here's where you see Africa and, um, and, uh, and the, the experts also say that developing countries are just as they develop need much more energy in general. So it's something that we need to be aware of and it's challenging. Um, I, this, this is Colombia up here because I gave a speech in Bogota about a little over a year ago and what has happened to their glaciers. South America disproportionately uh, dependent on hydro and the glaciers are melting. I've always worried about uh, uh, South America. They've got 80, 90 percent of their electricity generation in many countries, including Colombia, is from hydro generation. And the glaciers are melting. What happens first is you get more electricity and then you get none, basically. Um, and uh, this is the uh, same thing happening to a glacier in Montana and a glacier in Peru. You can see the pictures, uh, 1913 and 2012, basically gone. And I mentioned I'm from New Mexico. I actually live in New Mexico and commute to Washington every week where I work. Um, I used to water ski. This is a, a reservoir on the Rio Grande, 1994. This is what it looked like in 2013. Um, uh, highly problematic from, from, a, uh, from a climate change perspective. This is land use intensity for various energy sources in 2030. I think people need to pay attention to this um, uh, as, we, as we build out wind farms, so, solar generation, um, and, and you look at urbanization, et cetera, et cetera, land use becomes an issue. You see here wind is, uh, I don't know what the units are, uh, uh, square kilometers uh, per terawatt hour per year. Okay, so wind 72. Um, solar PV, I was surprised it was, that, it was half of that, basically. And natural gas, 18, and you get down to nuclear, it's 2.4. So, so as we start worrying about land use, et cetera, et cetera, those are considerations that have to be made. Now I'm going to switch gears. And, and uh, you all are sitting in the middle of the, uh, the Marcellus Shale. Um, I started a shale gas company and R&D company in 2002. We were very focused on this region of the world and the Barnett Shale at that time. And, um, and what you are seeing now, and I'll show you a little bit more about how that has affected U.S. LNG, but you're seeing significant volumes of gas starting to move around the world. And, and right now there are three distinct natural gas markets in the world, US, Europe, Asia. And they, had, they set prices in very different ways. Um, as LNG uh, starts moving around the world, this is, you see pipelines, that's red. These are the volumes, BCF, okay, volumes coming up, actual LNG. And these are LNG capacity additions under construction. And, and uh, so by, they'll be completed next year. So what you're seeing is basically the development of a global gas market. As, as the LNG starts moving around the world, they w there will be a spot market develop. Um, prices will become, it's like we have a global oil market. 
basically there is one price of oil but for transportation and the quality of oil. That's what you're starting to see in gas. I, as I mentioned before, U.S. Uh, uh, CO2 emissions went down from 2014 to 2017. That's because we developed gas in this country. We switched from co coal to gas generation. This LNG moving around the world could help with that because there's a lot of coal generation in the rest of the world. There's a lot of oil generation in the rest of the world too. We don't think about it here. We've stopped using oil for power generation except for a few small number, small number of places in the Northeast, far New England. And we've stopped using oil for generation in the US. They use it a lot in the rest of the world. So this is a way, quite frankly, to lower emissions in parts of the world. The, uh, I was in Berlin uh, giving a speech, uh, a small group of people, and, and uh, the German government came in and said, We're gonna, it's all going to be wind and solar. Somebody raised their hand and said, what about the coal plants I'm building in Southeast Asia? And that's where a lot of these are being uh, built. I had my staff calculate for me the emissions from coal plants in the world under construction. Just under, not, not announced projects, actually under construction. The emissions from coal plants under construction last year is equal to all the annual emissions of the UK. So to me, that suggests some technologies, as India, you know, and its population, et cetera, et cetera, some technologies we need to focus on. The world is going to be using coal. We need to capture the emissions, basically, from that coal. Um, uh, significant, as I mentioned, significant LNG volumes. We have also, this is an energy security issue, and it's also helping with the, uh, with the development of a global gas market. I actually went to Panama. Uh, when I came back from Colombia to see the widening of the Panama Canal, it's amazing. Okay, but before they widen the, the canal, only 23 of 421 LNG vessels could move through it. Now 90% can. I saw one move through the canal. So that's creating a lot of global trade opportunities between the U.S. and China, coal generation in China as well, um, as well as some places in South America. This is global energy investment in 2017. 2017, for the first time ever in the history of investment, uh, uh, investment in electricity, actually at 750 billion, you can see how it breaks out there, exceeded the investment in oil and gas supply, first time ever, 716 billion. We've got coal on top of that. but. Oil and gas uh, supply 716, electricity 750 billion. You've got efficiency there. Um, I actually broke this out by the China and the United States as well because they're a competitor. How do, what are they? What what is the world investing in in China? It's not just a Chinese investment, it's a lot Chinese, but what's the world investing in? U.S. upstream oil and gas. We're green, twice over twice as much as the Chinese. They don't have a lot of oil and gas in China. But renewables, look at China and the US, exactly the opposite. So the Chinese are investing in renewables. They're also beating us in electricity networks. What I would say to that is the Chinese are building out their grid. They don't have a grid like we do, uh, universal access, et cetera, et cetera. But what that also means is they will have a more modern grid than we do. And so we need to be another set of uh, technologies and innovation we need is to invest in grid modernization. That's what that says to me if we want to remain competitive. <laughs> um, to go through this very quickly, this is just 2018 compared to 2017. Um, I was a little surprised power sector actually went down a percent, oil and gas supply up a percent, efficiency uh, stable, coal supply went up. 2% uh, renewables down for transport and heat. And, but again, you see 300 billion in renewables in 2018, uh, 110 billion in fossil fuels. And these are investments, it's not R&D, these are investments in, in, uh, in generation, uh, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is another interesting thing. I look at patent activity. National Science Foundation does a, an activity index, okay, and, and I, I, don't, I won't go into how they calculate it. I looked at the EU top three. EU top three, wind, nuclear, and hydrogen. So I was surprised about the nuclear there. 
Japan, this is not surprising, hybrid electric fuel cells, hydrogen. They're trying to develop a hydrogen economy in Japan, not surprising. US, completely different than the EU and, and Japan, bioenergy, uh, cleaner coal, and a smart grid. So, so I thought it was interesting where, where our patents are being registered in the United States. I'm going to skip through this. It's boring. Hold on. Um, uh, now I'm going to go to some, some US trends. Those are kind of global trends that we should all be thinking about from a competitive standpoint, uh, uh, CO2 emission standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. Go through some quick, uh, quickly trends that we see in electricity uh, or in energy markets in the United States. The overarching trends, changes in US supply profile. We are now the one, uh, number one producers of oil and gas in the world. Um, uh, has affected our, our uh, emissions and our standing in the world. And we finally really, I think, are actually the swing supplier. Um, had we not developed, it's basically uh, shale oil, had we not uh, been such a major producer of oil, that attack on Saudi Arabia that happened three or four weeks ago, oil prices would have gone through the roof. But we're now such a huge supplier of oil, they did not. It was, it was barely a ripple in markets. Um, uh, re shift from resource to technology base, that's really your renewables. Um, uh, it's technology based generation. You don't need, you know, it's not a, it's, you got wind and solar, um, uh, but you need technologies to use them. Digitalization, big data analytics, electrification and electricity uh, dependence. Demographics, I already mentioned that. Decarbonization of the electricity sector. And the boundary conditions that we see every day as we try and develop uh, technologies for decarbonization in the US, it's a multi-trillion dollar per year business, highly capitalized commodity businesses, exquisite supply chains. That's my boss's word. It's a physicist's word. It's not mine. A complicated and complex supply chains is what I would say. And established customer bases that provide essential services at all levels of society. This leads to systems with considerable inertia, very hard to change, um, aversion to risk, again, very hard to change, and extensive politics and regulation and, and weird politics, too. Um, these are sub subnational uh, 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 entities that have committed to Paris uh, right after uh, President Trump announced we were getting out of the Paris Agreement. A whole bunch of entities said that, that we are still in, we're going to meet them. What you have there, you have 22 states that said they were going to meet them. Those are in the dark green. Cities and counties that include the state's largest city. The state didn't do it, but the count city largest city did. That's Texas. The five largest cities in Texas have said they're going to meet Paris commitments, but the state did not. Atlanta, Georgia said they were going to do it. The state did not. And then you've got city and county commitments in blue, and then states with no commitments. Um, there, you've got 246 institutions of higher learning. I don't know if you all are one that did. I don't know. Um, uh, but but uh, so everyone, there's, it, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's good news. The problem is everyone has different goals. Everyone has different, me there's no baseline. It's very, very difficult to measure progress. And when you go to a COP, I was at COP24 in Poland, when you go there, Subnationals do not have the same status as nationals do, and the subnationals have to report up through the, the nation. And so, so uh, it's great, but it's, it's a problem. Um, I mentioned all of the issues in the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. There, uh, that is leading many countries. They're not on here, not the US, but uh, countries and, and subnationals to uh, s adopt net zero emissions policies, not 80% not by 2050 net zero. I'll say a little bit more about net zero in a minute. But 80% but, uh, is not going to get us there. We're not meeting our goals already. And so we need, we need net zero emissions. We released a report, I'll say it now, on carbon dioxide removal. Um, carbon dioxide removal, we need innovation in it. It's very expensive. But when you look at the, you get to 80%, that remaining 20% is going to be very, very expensive to mitigate. 
And so we think that, that carbon dioxide removal, which is not mitigation, it's actually capturing carbon that has already been released. Mitigation is keeping carbon from being released. Um, we think that that, that capture is uh, post-combustion, whatever capture uh, is going to become very, very important in order to meet those goals. And uh, three states, Hawaii, uh, New York, and uh, California have net zero. <coughs> Um, uh, economy-wide, three or four states have net zero for electricity, and then you've got uh, cities, et cetera, et cetera, that have electricity and carbon neutrality. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, Anna mentioned, uh, I, we did the quadrennial energy review. I'm moving to some findings from that. This is when I mentioned that uh, these are the that variable renewables are, are making us technology based as to resource as opposed to resource based this is what I mean and and this is system reliability for electricity in a world where you have variable resources and this goes from decadal that's your climate your climate etc cetera, etc cetera, planning for your carbon goals down to the millisecond and we are now required in order to maintain a reliable system to respond at the millisecond level. That requires digitalization, automation, et cetera, et cetera, when you are managing variable renewables on your system and other things on your system. This is the kind of thing that we, we are having to invest in, the technologies we, we need to maintain reliability. Something else that we've seen, <coughs> I actually did this on an airplane one night, looking at five new areas in the energy space energy data analytics, building energy management, smart cities and grid, global drones in energy, and energy and cybersecurity, and started looking at the major, play major players in those spaces. And those are critical areas, like I just mentioned, for the, the future of energy in the US. Many, many of these players are not energy companies. If you live in Washington, DC, trade associations, the American Petroleum Institute, the American Gas uh, Institute uh, Association, the uh, Solar Energy Association um, uh, are energy companies. These are not energy companies. And I actually think that, that and they don't know that much about energy. Some of them are Siemens is, GE is, but uh, VDOS Global, FireEye, um, companies like that, these are not energy companies. They are not sitting there and talking to what are your traditional energy companies about energy issues. I actually think that we need to form a new trade association where these, these are basically uh, Internet of Things, digital companies need to sit down and talk with the energy companies and, and we each need to learn about each other and what, what policies, technologies, analytical support do, does everyone need um, for, for the energy of the future. This is LCOE, okay, and levelized cost of energy. Uh, an imperfect measure, but it, uh, EIA does it. They spent two years trying to develop a more perfect measure and gave up. They could not come up with one. And I'll show, I'm showing you this for a reason. Um, and it's, it's dollars per megawatt hour. You've got advanced nuclear there. Advanced uh, uh, natural gas combined cycle, $48. Advanced combined cycle with CCS, $75. Basically, that's with carbon capture and sequestration, 75 bucks. And, and uh, going through these, getting to onshore wind, $59. Solar PV, 63 Okay, um, and everyone is now saying, uh, wind and solar are cheaper than, than any other generation. That's not the case. Wind and solar are cheaper than any other generation in capacity markets. Capacity markets, which I think you all are members of a PJM capacity market here. Capacity markets uh, dispatch generation that has zero to, no, to little marginal cost. Wind and solar have zero to little marginal cost. But there's an infrastructure that's needed to support that, that that does not support. And in particular, here you see, this is Lazard, same thing, um, LCOE. Uh, Lazard did NGCC 35 to 81. That's fuel, the, the, different, the range is because of the fuel prices. 
Solar PV thin film, 36 to 44. Gas peakers, expensive. Solar, with, uh, solar thermal with storage. This is the uns unsubsidized, levelized cost of utility scale PV with storage is 108 to 140 dollars. So I go back to the NGCC with carbon capture at 75 dollars. This is very different, okay? And people and and I'll say a little bit more about storage in a minute. But we need to be honest about what these things actually cost. Um, and those are lithium ion batteries, different different types of batteries, flow batteries, which are very expensive. Um, uh, and this is uh, innovation resources, and I did this crude. This is percent of population in the United States without broadband, and and the dark, the darkest are over 20 percent of that population in that state does not have broadband. Um, next is is 11 to 20 percent. That's kind of where I stopped, and we did an innovation uh, heat map. Okay, Energy Innovation Heat Map, National Labs, RPE Awards, research universities, et cetera, et cetera. And, and very dense, you know, there's Massachusetts, MIT where I used to work. You have some of that on the West Coast. In the middle of the country where you see the, the, the innovation, it's generally speaking DOE labs. Okay, New Mexico, I'm from New Mexico again. We've got two national labs in New Mexico. Colorado has NREL. And Idaho has Idaho National Labs. So, 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 and so I, I did an overlay of my crude uh, PowerPoint drawn map against the innovation heat map. It looks like to me there's a pretty close correlation of places that don't have broadband and have low concentrations of innovation. The point is we need broadband everywhere to more broadly distribute innovation and innovation resources in this country. And I think it will help solve some of the, the urban-rural split that we are struggling with in our politics and that you saw in the uh, population maps I showed you earlier. Those are the seven states with over 20% without broadband. Those are the 22. Um, I'm going to go through that. I'm running out of time. There's something important at the end I want to show you. These are, this is power generation. These are EIA regions. I don't know why. I tried to find how they, they established, determined these regions. And I did, the, the red there is the price of electricity. Okay, it's, it's uh, uh, cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, a lot of variation across the country in cents per kilowatt hour your electricity. But I also looked at the largest generation sources. Three, three regions, coal. Five regions, largest generation source is gas. None of these are less than 30 per, 36%. So largest generation source is coal and gas. Uh, Pacific non-contiguous, uh, Hawaii and Alaska, it's oil, diesel generation. Uh, Pacific contiguous, California, Oregon, Washington, hydro. Okay, largest percentage. I also looked at what's going to happen to their hydro by 2100. Expect a decline of 21% because of climate change. Um, uh, it affects hydro pretty dramatically, as I said earlier. So then I did second largest. Three are natural gas. This uh, one is coal, second largest. This surprised me. Five are nuclear. I did not know that five regions of this country are that dependent on nuclear power. And, and one is wind, north the, the Wyoming, you know, that, that corridor, there's a wind corridor, and they've got a lot of wind there. The point on this, if we're going to decarbonize, regional solutions are needed. The costs associated with decarbonization are very, very different in different regions of the world. We need to be sensitive to that and not say, everyone's going to be running their grids on wind and solar in 10 years, okay? That is magical thinking, just like denying climate is magical thinking. We need to stop saying things like that. And, uh, and um, that, that's the percentage of uh, uh, non-hydro renewables, wind and solar. Uh, I think green is wind, red is solar. Um, uh, only uh, Three regions have 11 to 15% wind or solar, or, or 22%. Um, uh, five, six regions, it's no more than 5%. One region of the country has zero wind and solar. Okay, when I say it, I say uh, uh, I'm getting a, a five minute warning. Okay, let's get, we ought to talk about broadband. Let's go through this. 
um, smart platform technologies. I know you all are working on here. These are these are the technologies of the future that we need to spend a lot of time on. Smart grid, home energy management, 5G, artificial intelligence, added manufacturing, blockchain, I think can manage a lot of things in the world and high performance computing. Already made that point. Uh, this is, we did a study at California. I mentioned that earlier. Um, these are their emissions by sector. This is a, a typical that most of their emissions, 39%, are from transportation. Next is industry. Electricity, they've done a lot to decarbonize their electricity sector. Buildings, 9%. Agriculture, 8%. Um, uh, there is huge seasonal variation in, in California's wind and solar. They, they have a trough in the winter, peak in the summer. The variation is 3.1 terawatt hours between wind, uh, between the winter and summer. That is a huge variation. The, the, here's another variation, and I know you all are working on storage. I'll tell you why that's a concern to me, uh, battery storage. Um, this is, these are data. It is not a forecast or anything like that. It's data every year in 2017 in California. Blue is wind, red is solar. And the numbers that you see coming up there are the numbers of days in California with little to no wind. 90 days in one year, little to no wind. This will vary by region. It's not, gonna, it's not the same in Wyoming, okay? But I don't know how much wind you have here, okay? But, and they had 10 days in a row with no wind, et cetera, et cetera. And you just saw the seasonal variation, the delta 3.1 terawatt hours. This is the storage in California, battery storage, basically four hours and 150 megawatts. The, the message I, we, the conclusions we drew from this, battery storage here, PJM, where I think you all are, PJM uh, using batteries for ancillary services. Batteries in no way, shape, or form will manage 10 days in a row with no wind or 3.1 terawatt hours of seasonal variation with no wind. And so they're good for ancillary services, we think, until some major breakthrough in long duration storage, you need fuel to run your system. Okay, you can, right now that fuel is gas. In the future, it could be hydrogen, but we don't see any way to reliably run a system um, this is other, we looked at technology pathways. This was not a policy study of California. Can you meet your goals, your, your uh, decarbonization goals? Yes, you can, okay? And by 2030, you can't meet 2050. The technologies don't exist. But biggest in power generation, natural gas combined cycles with carbon capture and sequestration. Hugely important technology here and around the world. I would spend a lot of time on it. Um, interestingly enough, not electric vehicles, okay, CAFE standards, efficiency in your vehicles, huge, by far the biggest single category of anything. Electrification, pretty small here. Um, by 2030, California has a 5 million electric vehicle requirement, but they add 5 million vehicles to the road, so they're basically treading water. Um, industry, difficult to decarbonize, CCUS for industry as well. Um, energy efficiency in buildings, and uh, agriculture, very difficult to decarbonize. Renewable gas um, gets you decarbonized, decarbonizes your agricultural sector, but also gets you decarbonization of buildings. So, so using, using renewables for gas. I'm going to skip through this. This is a modern definite edition of energy security. I've gone on too long. Um, I mentioned LNG exports, U.S. LNG exports. These are where our exports are going. The point on this, 69% of our exports are now going to OECD countries, our allies. We need to protect those supply chains. Okay, it's a new, it's not an oil-centric definition of energy security, which we have had since 1974. It's very different. That's why those global LNG markets and this, we need a new definition of energy security. Here's another problem, electricity. Um, uh, when I was at DOE, it was oil, oil, oil. Um, we started the Department of Energy because of oil shortages. 
uh, uh, oil embargoes. One sector of our, our economy, transportation, depended on oil. Every sector, these are lifeline networks at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, critical infrastructure. And the point of this slide is they all depend on electricity. Electricity is the Uber infrastructure that is now um, that is now threatened by cyber attacks. We need to do something about that. And that's this is what's happening to our grids. Um, this is how it used to work. I did this. It's a cartoon. I, it's Kenderdine Utility. That's my name. I put it up there at the top. Um, we used to have one-way flows of electricity to three customer bases: uh, commercial, industrial, residential. This is how electricity is working now. Okay, you've got all sorts of options, okay, but you have unhardened devices all over the planet talking to the grid. Okay, it's creating options for consumers. It's also creating huge energy security issues. You need to automate these substations. It helps you with managing and taking advantage of all of this, um, but it also helps you manage cybersecurity. We used to have one-way flows of electricity. We now have two-way flows. The unhardened devices in your home, if they are hacked, can communicate with your, dis your transmission system, not just your distribution system. And, um, and then I'm going to say one more thing, because I'm getting the high sign. This is important. Okay, and this is about uh, World Bank did a, a uh, study of wind metals and minerals in the world and it's late 2017 that you need for wind solar and batteries 21 categories these are not critical materials critical minerals are one of the 21 categories so i went through and plotted on a map of the world where the number one resource holder was of these 21 and where the top five were okay u.s no number ones uh, 11 11 top five South America, it's, it's lithium, copper, and silver, okay, critical, critical minerals and metals for wind, solar, and batteries. Africa, basically uh, 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 cobalt. Europe has very little. Uh, this is what, oops, let me go back. That's what Asia looks like. China, 10 number ones, six in the top five. Australia, five number ones, 10 in the top five. One of them is lithium, okay? China's in the top five in lithium. Uh, when I was in Katowice, the, I had dinner with somebody from Australia. China's bought up the uh, Australian lithium mines too. And they're buying them in, uh, in Africa, the cobalt mines in Africa. Here are the number ones. Uh, not U.S., no number one, South America, copper, lithium, silver, lithium. We've made a down select to lithium ion batteries, uh, a huge issue. Um, uh, this is the top five for Asia. Aluminum smelter, aluminum refinery, cadmium, chromium, indium, pig iron, raw steel, molybdenum, silicon, rare earths, one category, titanium. Most of those are China. And this is Australia, where they've got crude iron, crude iron ore, uh, iron content, lead, nickel, and zinc. So, so um, and the numbers are staggering. This is lithium, okay? Lith this is what you use in lithium ion batteries, okay? U.S., these are metric tons, 35,000 metric tons. Chile, 8 million metric tons. Go down to cobalt, U.S., 38,000 metric tons. Congo, 3.4 million metric tons. What could go wrong in Congo? Okay, uh, and Australia, 1.2 million metric tons. Nickel, Lee, Elon, Lee, uh, uh, Elon Musk said that he's going to shift the balance of cobalt and nickel in his batteries. You can, uh, apparently you can, you know, they're proportional and you can shift. He's gonna do more nickel because children are mining cobalt in Congo. And uh, this is where the nickel is. United States, 110,000 metric tons. Indonesia, which is in the process of implementing Sharia law, 21 million metric tons. And Brazil, 11 million tons. You get the picture. When people tell you oil, gas, and coal are extractive industries, tell them about this. You want to see extraction. Um, and we, the, I think the World Bank said uh, we will increase our demand for metals by 600%. 
um, uh, in the next few years from, and this is what's happening to lithium, uh, lithium prices. $2,000 metric, $2, per metric ton in 2002, $18,000 in 2018. Um, and uh, this is a, I don't trust the source, but I like the information. I'll go back and look at them. Incremental commodity demand in a 100% EV world. Lithium uh, demand will increase by 2,898%. I, I, I'm saying we need to be cognizant of these supply chains. We need to protect them from an energy security perspective. Um, Defense Department protects the Straits of Hormuz. Are they protecting these? Okay, I, I can tell you the answer is no. And um, I've talked to people about it. And, uh, and that's who's mining uh, cobalt in, in Congo. My recommendation, we should increase our diplomatic and investment focus on the Western Hemisphere in Africa, protect the supply chains, support new domestic mining activities. I'm going to close with a slide on that. Support innovation in mining efficiency and in earth abundant materials for wind, solar, and batteries. Use renewable energy for mining operations. Promote humane mining conditions around the world. And so this is, I mean, this is my last slide. I uh, looked at where the inactive mines in the metals and minerals mines are in the United States. You can see them, copper, uh, copper uh, scattered throughout here. What I don't know is whether these are inactive because it become, became uneconomic to mine them or because they were depleted. It's more research that's needed. Copper is hugely important for wind turbines. They get struck by lightning all the time. You need copper to ground them. Okay, so, so, so you can see the, the red in there. I don't know what is in the other category. This is the East Coast where you all, I suspect that coal is in other, but I can't tell. I've got to go through and do more research on that. But a lot of inactive mines here. I am talking to the United Mine Workers and the Mining Association to figure out what is available um, uh, and what can we be doing to uh, enhance our own supply chains. I said uh, I lied. It's not going to be the last slide. Um, the, uh, this is our green real deal. Secretary Moniz, Assistant Secretary Karsner, he was an Assistant Secretary in the Bush administration at DOE. Um, the key point, the need for urgency and the disparate impacts of inaction underscores the dangers of magical thinking at either extreme. Climate deniers, as well as those with demonstrably impractical short-term feel-good solutions are moving us sideways when we need to move forward. 100% wind and solar in 10 years would be fit into that category. Um, this is, you can find this again on our website. This is a goal of our Green New Deal, provide a framework for accelerating deep decarbonization by mid-century, minimizing costs, maximizing economic opportunities, promoting social equity. And these are the elements we think you need in a Green Real Deal. Equitable transition, large-scale carbon management, regional solutions, support the workforce, implement a fair carbon price, invest in, in climate resilient energy infrastructure, innovation portfolios, and sustainable and secure energy supply chains. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Anyone? For that, thank you, Melanie. Do we have questions? Right here. The MIT. Oh. <laughs> Um, My son graduated from MIT, so yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Lots of really densely interesting information and visualizations. I have a somewhat specific question, and I'll preface by confessing that I'm working in a group here that does battery research. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I understood that. I'd like to talk to folks. So. Yeah, um, so, so my specific question is um, you, you showed uh, vehicle electrification as having a comparatively lower uh, potential emissions reduction compared to a couple of other things. And I, uh, my understanding is that would depend a lot, of, like how much reduction that represents would depend a lot upon um, how quickly the rest of the grid yeah, transfers yeah, right. and also like things like smart grid and to manage times of charging and stuff. Is there any... Uh, sense of the sensitivity of that number to some of those factors? That's by 2030. So it's purely sensitive to how, how rapidly a fleet turns over, OK? And, and that's a, very, a pretty short time frame for the turnover of a fleet. And when, when we looked at 
when we looked at the the growth of the number of ve overall growth in the number of vehicles in California compared to what they expected from EVs, um, it was basically one for one. So you did get reduction from it, which means you are getting reduction if it's a one for one trade off, but it's not what you might otherwise get. I would say by 2050, it's going to be very, very different. And I personally think batteries for EVs make a lot more sense. Electric vehicles and, and lithium ion batteries for EVs makes a lot more sense than for grid scale storage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really, and, and, and I think we've basically solved the range anxiety issue. California, only 16% of their emissions are from electricity, so they've got pretty clean electricity. They got a lot of gas. 49% of their in-state generation is gas, but their electricity uh, generation is pretty clean. EVs work well there. You know, you need the infrastructure, and you're, you're going to be generating more power. So you got to, you got to, you got to. And and it, it does bother me that people, oh, it'll if you just charge your cars at night, when electricity prices are low, it will be fabulous. If everyone's charging their cars at night, electricity prices at night won't be low. So, you know, so, so that's a little bit of magical thinking. But, but I do think EVs are, are the answer. Okay. The, the one thing, another thing I would say about that, I worry about the transition. And everyone thinks I'm worrying about the, e, the charging infrastructure. I'm worried about the opposite. California, $140 billion a year in tourism. People are driving from other states to California. If they don't have EVs in those other states, where will they fuel their cars in California? It's that transition I'm more worried about than the transition to electric vehicles in California. So, and we need to think, it's a transition issue. It's a, it's a tough issue, so. I think you mentioned that the last 20% of carbon emissions would be really expensive yeah. um, to get rid of. Hugely expensive. Um, would you mind elaborating on that? And um, mm -hmm. the, well, we, we had a discussion yesterday about the social cost of carbon, and, and in the Obama administration, it was $40 a ton. $40 a ton really, uh, the only area it might potentially have an impact on is electricity. Electricity sector, most difficult to decarbonize, I mean, easiest to decarbonize, not easy, but the easiest of the sectors I showed you, easiest to decarbonize. And so $40 a ton might get you something in the electricity sector. It gets you very, very little in, for example, the industrial sector, which I would say industry and agriculture are the most difficult to decarbonize. And, and so, so those, those get much more costly in general. $400 a ton, $200 a ton, et cetera, et cetera. But when you get to the last, the last 20%, you're talking $1,400, $1,500 a ton. And that's when something like direct air capture of carbon starts looking much more attractive. And it's expensive. It's that expensive now. But, but if you can do innovation between now and when you have to get the last 20%, and get the cost down, then you can help lower the cost of that last 20%. And, and it's significant, but it's also critical. I showed you the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. Um, and and uh, that's where you start needing things like direct air capture and, and uh, carbon dioxide removal um, to get the, because every 0.5 five, every five, uh, degrees really matters. And as you can see from the impacts, and um, and uh, and uh, so we need to spend some time thinking about that. That we have a little time to think about. Other things we don't. And we were talking about methane earlier, and and uh, and I've I've never I was at MIT when um, Howarth at Cornell came out and said gas is worse than coal because of methane emissions. The MIT scientists, climate scientists, went crazy over that. 
They were, this is an, this is an MIT story, the person wearing the jacket will like. Um, the White House called me, a friend of mine at the White House, and fight, fight between two a academic institutions over, over coal versus gas. And could you get your MIT climate scientist to write an op-ed? I'll go talk to them. I went and talked to three of them. I thought maybe I'd get something in a couple months. No offense to academic institutions, but they're kind of slow on that kind of stuff. By the time I got home, those three climate scientists felt so strongly about it that they had sent me an op, a draft op-ed for the New York Times. It had a formula in it, OK? <laughs> I had to tell them, you don't put formulas in op-eds for the New York Times. But that's how strongly they felt about it. The thing that's good about methane is it gives you early gains. And we need significant early, because its residence in the atmosphere is only 10, 12 years. So you get early gains, and it buys you a little time to get the cost down for that last 20% that you've got, or uh, to, to develop regulatory structures for uh, carbon capture and sequestration everywhere, et cetera, et cetera, and deploy those technologies around the, the world. We need to buy some time on that. And, um, and uh, so, so uh, uh, that's a long story for a short question. <laughs> $1,400. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so hi. Uh, this is regarding uh, the electric vehicles. So yeah. we were discussing that it looks like a very exciting avenue. Yeah. But as far as the developing countries are concerned, right. uh, what would you suggest be the timeline to integrate the electric vehicle into their daily use or system? Well. Developing countries need electricity <laughs> before you can use you can electric use electric vehicles, and and uh, right now, as I said in in uh, India, uh, Modi you know he wants to provide universal access to electricity. That means adding 450 million people to a grid. That that implies that a grid needs to be built out. I was in uh, Delhi. I don't know, a couple years ago, and, uh, and leave something to be desired. You know, huge, huge uh, jumbles of wires hanging over streets. Um, and uh, I, I was just hoping none of them were live um, as I was going under them. But, but I can't give you a timeline for developing countries and electrification of vehicles because electrification comes first. And and uh, was in Africa last summer. Uh, again, rural electrification in Africa, one percent, two percent, seven percent. Many countries like that. And um, and uh, that's a place where I think distributed solar would make some sense because because two hours of electricity makes a huge difference in in people's lives. But that doesn't, that doesn't help you deal with things like uh, cooking with charcoal. That's deforesting Africa and killing people who are using it. Um, uh, I think we need to look at a range of solutions in a place like Africa. EVs is not something I'm worried about there right now. I'm worried about getting rural, uh, electricity to rural Africans or four, million, four, four cities of 10 million people. Um, how are you going to provide them with electricity? It's not going to be with rooftop solar. And so, so uh, I think that you're going to use probably use fossil fuels for that. That's why carbon capture and sequestration uh, is important too. So, I think that's me. How much am I on? Yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for your time and and very thoughtful discussion. Um, I'll just say to some of the commentary earlier, I, I just get a little tired of people getting overly emotional about the issues. I don't know that we're Republicans, Democrats, or whatever you want to name, or whatever nationality we are. We're all humans, and we all should be concerned about where our world is going and do the best possible things going forward. Okay, so that's my speech. So with that thought in mind, what policy issues and how would you approach it to get everyone on the same page? to do the right thing? Um, I actually, I'm, I'm going to address this from both sides, the, the deniers and the, the, the not, both sides of magical thinking, who I think the gentleman uh, earlier is, is thinking magically that, that uh, 
Um, and I keep going back to the 100% wind and solar in 10 years. And, and um, uh, the, the deniers, I think that there will always uh, be people who are opposed uh, to any action on climate change. I have to tell you that the visible impacts, the impacts of climate change are becoming much more visible. And I think that that's starting to affect people's views on climate change. The, the horrible hurricane that we had, the melting glaciers that we had, it was 109 degrees in Paris this summer. The, the, the uh, funeral for the, the uh, glacier in Iceland. Um, and, and quite frankly, the chairwoman of the Senate Energy Committee, Lisa Murkowski, is from Alaska. She's looking at those pictures of the Bering Sea. She's a supporter of action on climate change. And so, so I think it's becoming more visible. I, I, I think that there's a perceptible change uh, and a growing group of people who are not deniers anymore. I also think on the opposite side that there are people who understand, and, and, and one other thing I'd say on the oil and gas climate initiative, you know, they got, they're put, the, the super majors in oil and gas are putting money into climate change, and, and people will say it's greenwashing, and it might very well be um, they're doing some valuable research projects. Okay, and they, they would support something like carbon capture and sequestration, which I think is essential for around the world, if not for here. And, and, um, but I also think on the, on what I'll, let's call the left, and I'm a Democrat, obviously. I worked for eight years for Bill Clinton and four years for Barack Obama. I'm a Democrat. I, I don't know who Matt Gates is. Okay, so, um, but the, uh, I know he's a Republican congressman. That's not true. I know who he is, but I don't know him. The, I was surprised in, with the California study that says basically because of the 90 days with no wind and the limitations of battery storage, I thought we would hear more from the enviros who say it's all wind and solar or nothing than we did, okay, because those are data. Okay, so I think both sides are looking at data and understanding that we need to address climate change. It is urgent, and we've got to use all the options and be flexible in how we address them because of things like the regional differences, the global differences, the the uh, the one-to-one -one correlation between electricity consumption and where a country, country sits on the human development index. We have to take all of those things into account. Um, if we uh, do things, I think, um, and are not cognizant of the need to build coalitions, we end up delaying action. I've, I think we've delayed action by 20 years by not opening up the tent, looking at all of the options, being less prescriptive. I didn't get to talk about our Green Real Deal very much, which might be why the gentleman misunderstood it. Um, uh, that that uh, that one of the the principles that we support is optionality and flexibility. Don't tell the southeastern United States how it has to decarbonize. Tell it it has to decarbonize and let them figure out how they do it and what technologies they use to do it. So, so um, I think that I th I'm, I actually am more optimistic than. And that is not my way, okay? And, and so, so I'm, I'm, I, some signs are good. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned that you were uh, surprised that a lot of regions, the number two uh, producer was nuclear. Yeah. Uh, going forward, like nuclear is an emissions-free technology, sure. and it seems like there was, uh, you didn't, you guys didn't focus on that as a, a space for innovation in terms of like small scale nuclear, more nuclear, more modular plants right. um, and innovation in that as a way to decarbonize as opposed to just capture and storage. Um, what, what I didn't show you, and this is California study, uh, we also did a clean energy innovation study, which I just talked too much and didn't have time. Okay, but the, the 
the technologies I showed you that you asked questions about, somebody asked a question um, on the EVs. That's 2030. From energy systems perspective, 2030 is right around the corner. California also is shutting down its last nuclear power plant. So, so when we were looking at California, we did not, in the 2030 time frame, look at nuclear. We just, you know, because we were operating within, their, within the constraints of their law. In the 2050 time frame, okay, and I said, we don't, we don't see all of the technologies, mature technologies yet for 2050 for them to meet their goals. The chapter says that. One of the technologies in there that, that we need to, they need to look further at is small modular reactors. And, and small modular reactors, I think, are hugely important. The rest of the world's building nuclear power plants. We built one in Georgia. It has been a disaster. It bankrupted Westinghouse. Okay, it is, it, the overruns are astronomical. That's not a good example for building new, new nuclear in the United States. Part of that is because we haven't built nuclear for a long time and we don't have the workforce um, uh, to, to build nuclear, large scale nuclear power plants. Small modular reactors are basically production line development. And so you have a sustained workforce that's working in an assembly line, basically. And, and, uh, and so you get the economies of scale. You get, you get, uh, you get that kind of workforce uh, development and sustaining uh, development from small modular reactors. So we think it's a, an option. We're not there yet. We don't see you know, development and deployment and diffusion into a marketplace by 2030 is not possible. But we, it's a hugely important option uh, for 2050. So, I think we have one last question over here. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions, but I guess I'll just focus on, this seems to parallel the Montreal Protocol almost in terms of there's negative global externalities. We need a bunch of countries coming in there's together. There's negative what? I can't hear you. Um, there's negative externalities. Right, right. And so we need like a bunch of countries to come together and also like optionality and flexibility. Right. And the Montreal Protocol is now sort of being tested for the first time um, in China with like using CFCs again. What are your thoughts on almost global like enforcement since we're almost seeing yeah. breaking from the Montreal yeah. Protocol now and like... I haven't thought about the that? Montreal Protocol in a long time, so I, you know. Yeah, um, just because, uh, like, I see this paralleling that. Yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at it. I, 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 now I'm going to go back and look at it to see what kind of parallels you're seeing between that and what was it, 92 or, yeah, not, uh, Montreal was 92, and, uh, and I was actually uh, raising a, a one-year-old child in 1992. But the, um, the, uh, uh, so I'll go back and look at it. Your question about international enforcement is something that bothers me. I don't know how to do that and under what auspices you would do that. There's no enforcement. Yeah, there's no enforcement of, of Paris or anything like that. And, um, and uh, we were thrilled in the Obama administration, and this was done before Paris. Um, we were thrilled when, uh, and I think it was John Podesta actually went to China and got them to commit to emissions reductions. And just getting them to commit to emissions reductions was huge. International enforcement's a huge problem. And, and uh, right now we are, we are not doing anything to empower international institutions. In fact, we are doing the opposite. So. I, I don't, I'm, I'm pessimistic about that, but I think it's a big issue and what can we do to, to enforce. And if you would like to write a paper on it and, and give it to me, I'll make a fancy slide from it. Okay, so. <laughs> so with that, thank, thank you, you, Melanie, for Great. your time today, thank obviously. You. A thank lot you. of important information. Great. Thank you to all of you for being here. I look forward to seeing you again, particularly if you come on October 22nd.